good. I'm a little taken back. I didn't. I actually, I didn't know this was happening. I came around the corner and I'm like, "What the fuck? What's going on here?" No one's got guns though, so I hope I'm safe. Yeah. Here we go then. Do we have a first question over here? Oh, it's far away. Someone over there? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How are you? I'm very I'm good. Siam from the Media Mitzma TV. Hope that you are doing great. Great. Hope that you enjoy Hellfest yes. today. So we are so happy to be here. Not a second. So so dark. Yeah, I'm so happy. Sorry, so oh, come on. Are you giving me a hug? Oh, thank you so much. You guys bring us joy, you know, and happiness. You know that. <laughs> I'm so sorry for my colleague. I'm too happy. No, no, no. That's all good. Thank you for good. the hug, really. I oh, no worries. <laughs> so, yeah, um, this is my first question. Okay. So, as an artist today, um, how do you feel about the world today? Be honest with us. How do you feel about the world today? Oh, the world? Yeah, yeah. What happened oh. in the world? Yeah. Because you guys well, have... Well, uh, I'm, I'm the wrong person to answer that because I will have... Uh, uh, they say basically you got 50 cent people this way, 50, 33, 33, 33. Um, and whatever you say, there's going to be a certain amount of people agree and the other are going to hate you. Whenever I speak, everybody hates me. So I, I, um, I, I'm like my dad. I don't tell people what I think they want to hear. And... Um, I think there's a lot of issues, obviously, and I see people saying the same things, just very predictable based upon their side, and nobody wants to communicate. Looks like I've been saying it a lot. They want confirmation. They want you to tell them a certain thing to, to fit in and have that whole situation, and that's a big part of the problem with the world. No one's really communicating, and uh, so it, it's, it's sad in a lot of different directions, and I see people that I know that like they they're like puppets that just regurgitate stuff <laughs> and it's like sad you can't have a conversation and i think the until people can learn to actually talk and when people say words are violence i think that's terrible because i know what violence is i've had a lot of friends killed and to put that in the same equation where you say if i say something and you don't like it that that i've assaulted you or something that's crazy because actually i haven't said anything bad at all i'm just trying to come to an understanding and try to uh communicate and i'm not trying to i'm not the one that's trying to force my opinions on other people but when people try to force their opinions on me it's it's 1980 you know 80 79 again and i don't like that and you go the last thing i'll kind of end it up because i'm rambling but you always go to people and they'll come up and you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. And I say, well, why don't you go walk over there and do that? You can't tell me what to do. Motherfucker, you just been telling me what to do. And now I tell you and you don't like it. So why the fuck are you telling me what to do? So that's the problem. Everybody expects everybody else to do what they want. And they don't. Yeah. And, and I, I don't understand why people are scared of communication. Myself, but... Uh -huh. Okay. Is this on? Check, check. All right, hey. Hi there. Hey. Joseph here from Loud TV, fellow California boy here. Uh, what part? Uh, San Diego. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So, of course, the term crossover has been used quite a bit uh, in reference to your music, uh, but it could also be used in reference to the number of bands connected to Suicidal from both uh, former and current members. And with such an impressive depth of talent here that you have with your, your group today, and among those who have gone on to play with other groups, why do you think Suicidal Tendencies has been like a nexus for such an eclectic group of musicians? Well, I think it's one of the, it goes to the, uh, the other side of what I was just talking about. Um, we don't expect people to conform. We don't have a, a, an agenda. We don't have, you have to do this, you have to do this. I think the world is best when people are themselves. And I think we, it's, that kind of phrase has been hijacked where people, when they say be yourself, they want you to be what they want you to be, not to, for you to find out truly who you are. And when people follow, it's whether you go as stupid as the Wright brothers, when they said they were gonna fly, you know, it's like, oh yeah, right. But when people do follow their dreams, there's gonna be a lot of nightmares. And the people that are gonna handle the nightmares are the ones that are gonna be able to survive and have things that happen. And for us, um, I've never been, if I was to tell Thundercat, for instance, what to play on bass, something is wrong. 
something's wrong with me, not him. And I think that's one of the point. You let people do what they do best, what, the way they feel. And, and I think that that works when they, <clears throat> when they have the ability and talent. And, and uh, my, <clears throat> my dad said something way back. He goes, my dad's name is Gene. He goes, I don't want on my tombstone to say, here lies Gene Muir. He held people back, you know. And I want people to be able to be the best at what they do and for them to be happy at what they do. And when you do things that other people want you to do, you're usually not happy. You know, and when you think you're doing what you want to do, sometimes you find out that doesn't bring happiness and you go to a different path. But I think one of the things with suicidals is we don't try to make Thundercat uh, be Robert Trujillo, you know, and uh, and that type of situation. And uh, I, I I believe that's why you see the individuality of people that come through, but they also have an understanding of what suicidal is because they all heard suicidal and they know what it meant to them and they want to people to hear what they do to have that same feeling. So I, I feel very fortunate to be able to be with a lot of people that I, uh, incredible musicians, but more so incredible people, you know. Hey, how's it going? You stand up, I'll stand up. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm Archie Bynil from Mexico uh, and I get a question for you. Yeah. It's pretty sure. How would you describe the, relation, the relationship between your music and the skate punk uh, culture? Well, uh, to me, my brother was a pro skateboarder. And so he was five years older than me. So he was a pro when he was 17, I was 12 years old. So when I was 12 years old, obviously the world is pretty simple, but you look up at, you know, uh, Tony Alva, you know, all these Jay Adams, all these people and you see these great skaters that you wish you could skate like and and skateboarding was definitely a lifestyle uh back then uh, everybody had their skateboard with them all the time it's transportation it was a weapon it was uh, an activity and stuff and um so the first people uh they got into suicidal were actually the skaters the punk rockers said oh they're not punk they're metal the metal people said they're not metal they're punk and it was the skaters that first got in there and lance mountain um in 83 he drew one of the first uh, artwork and stuff and and i'm uh, huge it was a huge lance fan and stuff great guy and um so seeing all those uh, things happen um was for me was is was a great situation especially going to like skate parks and then hearing them start the music kind of changed and then hear them play suicidal at the skate park you know and and that type of stuff that was like wow that's so cool you know and, and imagine yourself when you're 12 years old not even doing music or think you could do music and then to be played and stuff so skating has always been a, a is a, a huge part to see what um the skaters are doing now and to be able to know them because of you know possess a skate and all that and the association uh it, it's it's great feeling Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, thanks for your music. Thank you. Hey, Mike. Yeah. Hi. Hey. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Sofian from the RTBF in Belgium. Um, when we see the suicidal tendencies pants, we, there is a very intergenerational aspect yeah. of it. You see different generation all getting into this beautiful organized chaos. And you mentioned your, your father a couple of times throughout this discussion. I want to know what influence your dad had on your taste of music and the rock star you became today. <laughs> well, my dad likes country music, <laughs> so, <laughs> but my, my dad was one that, um, uh, he played football in college, uh, American football, and when you're young and his friends are there and you're growing up and they're like, oh, uh, you know, is, are you, you're going to play football? And my dad said, he's going to do whatever he wants to do. And um, I think that's the thing with my dad, a lot of, like my friends now, They skate, you're gonna skate, you know, they, this or that, or when I was younger, people, if their parents were doctors, you're gonna be a doctor, this or that. My dad said he's gonna find his path. My brother ended up being, like I said, a pro skater. My sister was an accountant. My other sister was a speech pathologist. It's like, um, and I somehow got into music and, uh, and people question whether it's music, but you know, he let us find our own path. And I think that's the situation with, now I have four kids. It's like, what are they gonna do? I want them to find their own path. You know, I don't, I, I, I what are my uh, ex expectations and, and hopes is they'll be happy, that they'll find something that, that every day, that it may, yesterday may not have been the best, it may have been hard, but they're looking forward to doing it again today and trying to make it better, you know, and doing it for the right reason and they feel it in their heart. And there's too many people that don't feel things in their heart, you know, except for pain. And so um, I, I think that, 
that was a thing with my dad, but in the same sense, my dad knew nothing about music, but when we started, he was out there selling t-shirts, you know, and, and he was always there to whatever it was with my brother. He was there, I'm gonna help do what you're gonna do and stuff, and so that's what I, I learned is to be there to be to be helpful and be a part of it. And I think that that family thing is, a, is a massively important because I grew up and there's maybe three or four people I knew that their parents were together. You know, and I saw the difficulties and a lot of situations that people had stemming to their family situation or lack of it and that type of thing. And my dad, um, because of that, was very aware. And I was just talking about it. He said, you got three families in life. You got the one you're born into. You, you, they're not going to change. Your, your mom, your dad, or your sisters, your cousins, you have to make it work. And the things that work, remember those things. And the things that don't work, Remember those things so you don't repeat those things. And then you get a teenager and you, you have your family from friends that you go to school with or you live by, and you'll find out later you might be disappointed. And those are geographical conveniences. They're not friendships. And then you get older and then you make a family. And then remember all the things that, that, were, that were great and try to incorporate those and all the things that you didn't like and don't inc- and avoid them and stuff. So I think music is like that. It's, it's a family. And in the same sense, there's uh, one of the ones where traveling and, and for like France for the first time you go there, everywhere there's a different language. You see the differences. But when you get past that and you see the similarities, there's so many people I, that I know that I go, man, if we grew up, we would, I would be better friends with you than the people I grew up with. And then there's other people that you go like, wow, I'm glad I don't live by them, you know, and stuff. So it's amazing in the world um, how many great people there are and, and a reminder of like how many bad people there are, you know, and uh, try to avoid the people that are going to make uh, more problems in my life or not going to be a good thing because I, I, at the point, I can't fight everybody, you know, and uh, I, I don't want to fight everybody. But I, I do want to be a situation where people uh, that see suicidal, they understand why we are the way that we are and realize that, you know, and life is not always going to be easy. It's going to be fucking hard, you know, and, and with my kids in school, they don't teach them that. They teach them that there's all these problems and it's not their fault and there's nothing they can do about it. And that fucking pisses me off, you know, because I always grew up fighting, you know, whether mentally or physically and stuff. And I realize the mental ones are more important. But if you don't stand up for yourself, nobody's going to fucking do it, you know. And you have to believe in yourself because no one else will believe in you. They'll just believe in what they want you to do. And what they want you to do is at the end of the time when you're older, you're going to be full of fucking regrets, you know. And, and that's one of the things I believe. You have to follow your heart and not try to fit into other people's uh, choices. Thank you, sir. This was, j'entends, c'est bon. This was really beautiful, yeah. by the way, Thank the you. answer. Thank you so much. I uh, just have a question. When we think of uh, suicidal tendencies, I can't help thinking of your audience around the world. So how do we keep this flame alive between you and your audience. People um, are here and they yeah. support you and they love you and we can feel it, really. So I think um, I've learned that sometimes people like people as an escape. Um, they, you know, they, it's an imaginary world, you know, the actors or this or that. And then sometimes people, uh, I don't sound bad, they like people because they're a person. And I think people know that maybe I'm different, but I'm a person, and I try to be a person. I do not want to be a person. I, I, I want to breathe air. I want to drink water. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be anybody else. I want to be my kids to be people. You know, I want people to be able to get around. And my first choice is to want to not to uh, like people. And That would be my, my choice. I would love to like people. I can't like everybody, you know, and stuff. And I think people see that. And um, I enjoy, like, uh, we just did a song and for Brazil. We're going to Brazil. And we're very fortunate that we have all these Brazilian artists singing on the record. And to be someone from, like, Venice that I never thought I'd be able to go anywhere in the world 
And then you have people in Brazil that are singing on song because they, they love the band. It, it's a great thing, you know? And um, I, so I, I think wherever we go, there's been so many different stories. We, we toured here like 20 something dates. When we did that before, you're going an hour in between cities. You get there early, there's people there, they're taking you to their parents' businesses, you know, and, and all these different things. And, and it's a great thing to be able to meet people as people. You know, and and so I, I love that. Hi, Mike. Hey, this nice hat <laughs> and <you>. shirt. Oh <laughs> man. Yeah. Uh, this is Brock from Delicasap Magazine from Turkey. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, I'm curious about. Uh, are you uh, working on new stuff? Uh, will we listen new suicidal album or new uh, songs? Yeah. Well. One of the things uh, we did the last record of the World Gone Mad in 2016, and um, I kind of said, uh, it sounds bad, but I don't enjoy making records because it's it's like full on mental fuck, you know, to me, and and then it's the time and the family and everything. It's it's difficult, um, but now having like Ben in the band. Jay in the band, like one of the first things Jay did after we did a couple shows, is just like going, dude, I want to fucking make a record. I want to, you know, and and the way he and Ben, they said it, they go like, when we were, you know, Ben was like, when I was 12 years old and I heard the suicidal, it spoke to me, you know, and other music, I heard a lot of music, and he did, he goes, I want to do a record like that. And that's exactly what Jay said, obviously having Ty, you know, Robert's uh, son in there, Robert's like, dude, you guys need to make a record. You know, you do that, do that thing. And so I, 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 I think that we're leaning, definitely leaning towards doing it. And we realize that like a lot of people with music, you, you look around and you see what's popular, what's trendy. And we go back to what was popular and trendy in night when we did our first record and we didn't do any of that and all the reviews was terrible and so we'll do a record that people probably will not like and uh i will be very happy and stuff but Me i too. think that i think that years from now that people will sit there and and uh, there'll be a lot of people that are not so much into trends or genres that'll go like that's a fucking really badass record you know and so that's what i want to do so um I, I, as I say, I like to like people, but I don't care if people like me. <laughs> you know, it makes my life easier. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Guys, nobody else. Nobody else. Hello, I'm Svetoslav from uh, Hungary, 18 from Bulgaria. Oh, cool, cool. We're gonna be there. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always there. I'm yeah, always yeah. There. Uh, you've created probably one of the most amazing albums in your uh, history, uh, but you nearly never play any songs live uh, from it. Um, speaking about Art of Rebellion, mm -hmm. why is that? Um, when we did that record, uh, I think for me it was a record that I knew a lot of people would not like. And uh, people, I, I found like we did our first record, then we did Join the Army, and people were expecting to hear the same record, first record, done again, you know, and it was different. And then people didn't like that. And we did How I Laugh, which was completely different. And then when we did Feel Like Shit, which was completely different. And then we did A Lights Camera Revolution was different. And then we did Art of Rebellion was completely different. And um, uh, a, a lot of people uh, really did not like that. And for me, it was a record that, that I wanted to, that was actually a, more natural because I wrote a lot of the songs and uh, um, it was an easy record to make. Um, but it was a record I also wanted to make so that people could say we can do different things We're always expanded and stuff. And so um, I think that uh, live um, We toured off that record. We played a lot of it and, and just uh, Really don't want to ah, Haven't felt like playing any songs. Yeah, you have a French you have a French version uh -huh. You have a French version of uh, Monopoly of Soul. Yeah, it's so my, my favorite story um, the, there's a, uh, someone that, at the label that, that I considered a friend. She was a, a really sweet lady. And uh, so we really wanted to do something because we had uh, done so many shows in France and, and we felt so accepted. And um, I was telling the story how uh, uh, Solomon, who's the promoter, 
when we played the first time, he goes, I want you to play more sh places in France. And, and so I went to our, our booking agent and said, hey, I was talking to the promoter. He said, we could play all these other places. And our booking agent was English, said, oh, no, 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 no. You, you play in Paris because it's on the way to France, I mean, to London. And uh, I was like, oh. And Solomon really pushed, and we I fought and got it, did a couple shows, and it was great, you know? And then we uh, did a bunch more. We did, I, like I said, I think it was 20 shows one time. And the way everybody treated it was special. And so I, I wanted to try to do this. So I said, okay, we'll sing it. I'll try to sing it in French. And um, so when we got there, she, she was saying, oh, the song, what about this song? I can't even say it. She was, oh, I hear that. I just smile like this and that. I'm like, oh, I'm I feeling great. She goes, yes. She goes, I don't know what you're saying, but it sounds so funny, <laughs> you know? So uh, I tried, and then I was like going, okay, that's it. I'm not going to. But I, I, I think it's... Uh, the, the language sounds so beautiful, and and I thought my uh, it's it sounded really good, but obviously I'm not French, so it does not go over as well. But I think people appreciated the effort. I I did try, went to a because a, a, I never spoke French before. Went to a professor at UCLA to try to help me <laughs> to do a little bit, and then speaking and then singing are, are different things too. And um, but yeah, it was. It was, uh, it was intended to be a very uh, a heartfelt thing. Hi, Mike. I'm yeah. Paula from, from Hot Brigade Brazil. Hey, hello. I don't, yeah. I don't have a really question. Yeah. Just say we are waiting for you there. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, no, re really excited. So we, um, for the Brazil thing, we were had a week off and after this tour and then when the, uh, it's, I guess it's a National Rock Day. July 13th, and then when they had the, um, there's a, a, a arena, and it's, uh, they do a free show, and so that, like, okay, we'd love to do that. The only problem is I'm flying straight from here to uh, Brazil, and then straight from Brazil back to the States, and so it's, it's a long time, but to be able to do that's great. The only, the only bad thing is, you know, obviously Porto Alegre with the floods, because we were supposed to play there, and that was, that was kind of sad, because for, you know, besides the situation, so many people are like, don't cancel the show, don't cancel the show, and we really tried with the promoter and everything, and there was a massive flood in Brazil, and the airport was like four feet underwater. The the bus place, there's no way to get in there. There's so many people that are that are homeless, and you don't see it on the news. You know, it isn't something that you know uh, is is as clickbait as you know all politics and this and that. But it's it's you know it's sad what's going on, and having so many Brazilian friends and friends that have family there um, is sad. But there's no way we could do it. So we're hoping in the future to be able to do like a free show there when everything gets normalized. But that's that's the, that's the only bad side of it, but yeah, we're really excited to going back. Another question? Yes. From me, sorry. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> so I just want to say that lockdown helped me discover new band, new uh, things uh, like uh, rock, uh, pop. Uh, I, I mean, uh, lockdown helped me discover new things. So what about you? Did lockdown help you? Uh, discover oh. new music, new band, or stuff like this. I Thank thought that, you. I, th I thought that was a band, and I was like, I don't know who the fuck they are. You mean COVID? The COVID lockdown? Is that what you're yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's another one. You got to be careful what you say. Um, uh, I, I don't think that it was handled very well in a lot of ways and stuff. Um, and. Uh, there's a lot of people like why I don't like politics that brought out the absolute worst and you could see people just love being on camera and this and that and there's a lot of people that were suffering and um, you see um, uh, with this especially in the states with the kids and the schooling um, so many of my friends have kids the troubles that they went through and are going through you see the suicide rates gone way up and all these things and a lot of people won't talk about it because it goes against their politics rather than being like we got a fucking problem this is like you know people may not you know have to wear the mask or this but we got a problem people are messed up from that and so there was a lot of people that that did well usually people had a lot of money um came out of it really well um but uh there's a lot of people that that have not good environments that need to get out of there where they live that's their escape and and uh and keeps their sanity and they and they couldn't 
Um, so I, I, I found myself going the opposite. I did not listen to music at all, you know. I was uh, trying to, I was concerned. My dad broke his neck. My dad's 95 now, but um, he was 91, broke his neck uh, in January, right when it started. So he couldn't get the, the, the care that was needed. And then they also kind of based it on age. So he's like, oh, you're 91, you know. And um, so uh, there's a lot of issues where you see things that happened um, that I, I don't, don't like. So I, I was really concentrated on my family and that type of situation. I think that was the whole thing. I was really concerned about a lot of my friends. And um, so everybody had different experiences. I know some people, they made a lot of money. They're happy, you know. And uh, But I, I, I hope that... that uh, well, it's kind of sad because I, 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 people still can't talk about it because people say, well, you're a one. I go, no, I'm not. I, I just, you know, there's some things that don't you think, and on people on both sides, it's like there's a whole lot of space in between this side or that side. And, and the only reason why it's worth talking about is because when something happens again, we have to learn. You know, we have to learn. And I don't think people learn things. They've just learned to be more stubborn. And that's not good. Thank you, Mike. Cool. Guys, come on.